work. Um, her work is primarily in the syntax semantics interface, the inter and the relationship between the lexicon and combinatoric rules in language and cognition. She's worked on Scottish Gaelic, Bengali, English, Scandinavian, many other languages. And today she's going to tell us about the symbolic domain. So let us uh, welcome Gillian Ramshan. Gillian, take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to give a, a talk at this uh, great series. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen and uh, uh, the talk is entitled The Symbolic Domain, but in a sense, it's a talk about uh, cartography, because I gather that's what people would like to hear about from me. And I have a lot of things to say about uh, cartography and the whole cartographic enterprise and what I think uh, its contribution has been and what it shows us um, about the way language is organized. I think it's been an extremely uh, exciting and productive uh, domain of linguistic inquiry within the, the area of phrase structure and also in particular um, connecting to really deep questions about um, the syntax semantics interface. Um, and that's where I come in. That's where I've been interested uh, in following the results of the cartographic enterprise and try to trying to reconcile it with what uh, I've been thinking about with respect to the verbal domain and uh, the syntax semantics interface. It's a, it's, um, it, it, it's a difficult area, the syntax semantics interface, because you're always having to negotiate between the syntacticians and the semanticists. And I think uh, the cart cartographic enterprises uh, poses some uh, really interesting questions here. But unfortunately, what I'm going to end up saying, I think, is uh, going to be a little bit disappointing, maybe, for some of you who are particularly enthusiastic about um, cartography and uh, very elaborate functional sequences. So um, let me just start off by saying that uh, cartographic research um, over the past couple of decades it tells us that there seem to be, well, it seems to suggest that there are robust cross-linguistic generalizations of, of the ordering of meaningful elements in the clause. And one of the things I'm going to focus on here is that the is the evidence over and over again um, that there is sort of at the base of every functional sequence, there's we have evidence for this sort of substantive, conceptually rich uh, element. This goes all the way back to um, Grimshaw's original work on extended projection, you know, when you had a, a lexical item and then functional um, uh, elements on top. And this sort of layered meaning, it's pervasive. I think it's pretty, truly uh, exceptionless. Uh, but it kind of looks accidental from the point of view of our explanatory toolboxes, both in syntax and semantics. And I, I think that's a problem. I think we need to, to, to be asking the question, why here? So let me give you this little example there. Just I'm going to be concentrating on the verbal extended projection because that's the bit I know best and I, I, I know most uh, case studies about. Uh, here's just like a little excerpt, a kind of minimal excerpt. It isn't even like a full on, full fledged, all the heads that have ever been proposed version of this, but just a sort of a flavor of the kind of extended projection that has been um, argued for within the verbal domain. So you see the V right at the bottom, that's where you put your lexical verb. And then there's a whole host of functional projections that sit on top of that. And they tend to come in that order. And I've cited some some work which which suggests that um, that is the order uh, that you get cross linguistically. But even if you don't like that number of functional heads, um, even if you're not a particular fan of cartography, um, it's still the case that you've got um, some sort of layering, um, even if you believe VTC that's layering. And I would argue that's templatic too. And uh, there is currently no uh, real explanation for it. So um, uh, Ramchand and Sphenonius wrote a, a paper in 2014, which tried to reconcile the more spare version of the functional sequence with the more articulated versions. If you remember that paper, I don't know, maybe some of you read it, maybe, maybe not. But just to summarize what we said there, was that um, actually there's 
three main zones, and that's universal, but that each particular language probably has um, articulations of each zone, which are language specific and have to be learned. So the thing that's universal is really uh, much coarser grained, but the thing that's language specific uh, can be very fine grained for a particular language and is, is just simply learned. So uh, we said there were those three zones and in the verbal domain, we said the lowest zone is kind of events, the next one is situations and the next is propositions. I'm gonna come back to what we call those three zones as I go on, because I, I'm not going to endorse exactly the same um, labeling that, that we used then in 2014. Okay, um, so uh, in the verbal domain, as we all know, event participant information, actions are, what is called actions are, is low and it's closer to the root, um, more often built into lexical content meanings than, for example, temporal information uh, or speaker oriented information. So if this is true and if it's cross linguistically robust, why? If you are ask the syntacticians, they're saying, well, don't ask me, I'm just describing, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm representing it syntactically, but for a deeper explanation for this, you have to ask the semanticists because maybe there's a deeper cognitive explanation, but um, many syntacticians are also willing to bite the bullet and say that this is all like innate, like some sort of um, linguistic DNA. I don't believe that for a second, um, but if you don't believe that, then what is the explanation? So maybe there's some sort of cognitive explanation for why things are ordered the way they are. So let's go ask our semantics friends, because maybe they've got an idea of why uh, the ordering should be the way it is. Uh, but the semanticists can't help us because the semanticists say, no, 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 no. Um, uh, we can make our compositional semantics track whatever syntax you give us. Um, the, the hierarchy is comes from the syntax. We we can do anything you like. We can track anything that we like. We have the technology. We have the maths. And in fact, they're quite right. They're not just being uncooperative. Uh, they're right because their extensional formal ontologies um, uh, do not uh, have any inherent uh, reason for preferring one kind of information over another. Right? They're describing particulars in the world. There's no reason why causal information should be privileged over temporal information or anything like that. Those are just situations and all the aspects of those situations are equally present and equally relevant and equally criterial. So it's, it's a syntactic fact. It's a fact about language. And they're quite right to say that it's not in their toolbox to explain why things are ordered the way they are. But in fact, I'm going to argue that the situation is even worse than this. Um, what I'm going to argue in this talk is that the semantic cat labels in a cartography like that, those semantic labels, uh, they're they're not they're not sound. They they are not the right kind of labels to um, capture what is actually robust about semantic ordering. Um, Robust universal hierarchical effects only emerge if we notice, um, and here's what's going to be my so my positive claim here, um, if we notice the following overarching semantic distinctions. So the difference, I'm going to argue for a difference between essential reusable content, essential, by essential I mean um, essences, sort of inherent essential content, which is reusable versus particularized or referential content. And hopefully by the time I get to the end of the talk, you'll understand what I mean by that, just sort of foreshadowing at the moment. Okay, so here's the roadmap. First, on my, uh, um, on my way through this, I wanna show you first that the very same meanings, um, so the things that you might label with various categories from a semantics point of view, a formal semantics point of view, the very same meanings can and do appear in different zones in the hierarchy. And then conversely, what I wanna show another a little case study where I show you that um, in the same zone and in the same apparent position, uh, you can have different meanings in different languages. Um, and then only after I show you those two cases um, uh, and sort of, 
uh, destroy um, that uh, nice worldview, uh, I will try, hopefully, if there's time to give you my sort of more uh, positive contribution to what I think the, the domain of semantic generalization is that accounts for for the meaning layering that we find, the extent to which it is robust. Um, okay, so that's the plan. Um, and now I, I move to the first uh, element of the narrative, which is to point out that there are many, many cases where we have the same meaning in different zones. Um, there are many well-known cases of this. It's not usually considered to be the core situation of cartography, but if you do any kind of case study, the more you look, the more you see cases of this. And the most uh, um, obvious um, uh, situation where this arises is in the domain of modality. So uh, let me give you those uh, three versions of modality or three versions of the semantics of possibility, say. Okay. possibility where we need possible worlds to express it. So in one, you see John is persuadable, uh, use Ubble morphology there, but it indicates possibility. Um, here, it's the possibility that given the inherent properties of John's state of mind uh, with respect to this idea, John is persuadable. Okay. Um, in two, you see what's commonly known as, oh, number one is quite often called dynamic modality. And two, you see deontic modality. Um, if his mom gave him permission, then John can go to the party. So it's possible, but this time given the circumstances, including the fact that his mother has to give him approval. And in three, you see what's known as epistemic possibility. John might be at home now uh, because I know he leaves work at four, for example. And that is also possibility, but given the speaker's current state of knowledge. OK, this is well known. Um, uh, we also have a case, uh, for example, of, of obligation, where in 4A, I have given you a case of obligational um, uh, an obligational situation, an obligational relationship stated in a biclausal way in 4A and a monoclausal way in 4B. So even uh, biclausal uh, versions of this are possible. So what's up with that? Um, do we just say, oh, that's a funny thing about modals? Or do we make labels like dynamic, deontic, uh, epistemic to make them seem more different than they are? Or do we acknowledge that fact is there's something about this that um, is the same across the three zones, um, but then uh, modulated in a kind of predictable way? And Kratzer tried to do this earlier in, in, uh, in the classic view of modality here. She tried to do this by saying, yes, all the models uh, in this uh, family are the same. They're existential quantifiers um, over these possible worlds. And what varies is the modal base in some way. So there's some sort of contextual or pragmatic modulation, whereas the modal can be the same semantically. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work. And it didn't work because of what we discovered from uh, cartographic research, which was that uh, the different flavors of the modality were in fact correlated with structural height in the functional sequence. So the dynamic modality was low, uh, epistemic modality was the highest, and circumstantial modality was in the middle. Um, Valentin, ha Valentin Hakkad uh, tried to uh, give an account that reconciled Kratzer with the facts from cartography. Um, and I'm not going to have time in this talk to explain to you why I think her solution does not actually solve the problem. It doesn't actually work. Um, uh, but the point is not really that. If you're interested in, in that, I, I'm happy to answer that question in the, in the question and answer session. Um, but my, my purpose here is not to argue against a particular analysis, but just to point out that it's quite general that certain aspects of meaning recur in every zone, possibly with distinct lexical items, but the flavor of the meaning changes subtly um, and in a predictable way. So the clue to the difference between the zones must rely on what, what changes then uh, reliably occur. 
So uh, in, in my most recent monograph, I argued that um, uh, when, it came, when it comes to modality, it's the notion of choice that is the same. So that is the same semantics. Um, but the size of the prejacent uh, compositionally affects who the chooser is and what the source of the open-endedness open or the um, uh, uncertainty uh, is. So choice uh, with respect to some sort of uh, domain of uncertainty. In the case of dynamic modality, uh, the, the one who is having the choice or the choices is the actor the participant in the event and the source of uncertainty is the causal abilities of the actor. In the circumstantial domain, which is the, the higher one, the inflectional domain of the clause, it's the situational participant and the undecidedness of the future. So it's a temporal uncertain uncertainty that's at stake there. Whereas uh, with epistemic choice, it's the speaker and their uncertainty with respect to which propositions are true or not. So incomplete knowledge there is the source of the uncertainty. Um, so the same meaning is occurring in three different zones. The lowest zone in this story, and this is going to be a recurring theme, the lowest zone is atemporal without actuality attainments. The middle zone is spatiotemporal and quantifies over particularized situations, whereas the outer zone is about the communicative and epistemic relationship of the speaker to the situation. In building a proposition. Um, so this is how I would semantically characterize the three zones, right? So you can't put possibility or choice in the FSEC, is my point, because you're going to have to give it a diacritic for each of the different zones. The same broad point can be made for causation. So I can say Mary caused John to fall off his horse, but I can also say Mary pushed John off his horse. And you can see that from the point of view of pure semantic sort of entailment about what happens and who causes what, um, the, the, the situation is the same in five and six. But there is a linguistic difference because in the monoclausal situation, in the, in the, in the low uh, causation situation in six, um, the pushing and the falling off have to be cotemporaneous. And that's because the causation is folded in uh, before any temporal um, uh, instantiation is is asserted, uh, and the same that is not true of five, where the cause is folded in folded in uh, in a higher spatial temporal domain. Okay, so what are the consequences for cartographic heads? Then uh, um, it's that number one, it simply won't do to have a head, a single head for cause or for possibility, because it would have to be diacritized for different zones. Um, multiplying, we've seen it, multiplying heads for modality has come up with three flavors, but these are diacritics, basically, epistemic, circumstantial, and, di and dynamic. But this is not progress unless it generalizes across different kinds of meaning. And you will see if anyone who has done any work on uh, adverb ordering or adjective ordering regularly comes across uh, adverbs duplicated in different zones. And what happens? Well, you, you actually give it a different label. But then I think the reasoning is circular because what's actually happening is that you have the same meaning, but it's in different zones. So you have to worry about the way we are labeling our um, functional items in the functional sequence and uh, how we can independently mm, justify that certain meanings occur in a certain order um, uh, on pain of circularity. I think on the other hand, this is a clue that we see over and over again, the same meanings recurring in different zones. Okay, so now the converse case, here we have the situation where uh, same zone, same position, but different meaning. And the test case I want to use here is a spectral morphology in English versus Russian. And we know uh, and generally in Slavic languages, uh, verbs are marked for perfective versus imperfective. But in English, no, no such thing. We have simple present and past. But in addition, there's a progressive construction. The English progressive uh, indicates ongoing meanings in the present and past, but the Russian imperfective has a much wider uh, variety of meanings. So quite different, right? Okay, but now 
if you start looking carefully and doing the sort of the hard detailed work on a particular language, as I did, for example, for the progressive, what I discovered, first of all, was that the progressive was in a very low zone in the English functional sequence. And I presented a lot of evidence in the in the monograph that I referred to already. I refer you to that for the different evidence, uh, which is taken from, you know, work from many people across the field. Um, and I think this slide maybe summarizes it best. If you look at an ing phrase, it actually patterns with main verb phrases in having a position for the external argument. Um, it also uh, forms a unit with respect to independent mobility, and it also uh, can be substituted by the pseudo auxiliary verb do. Uh, and so with respect to, to these different uh, syntactic diagnostics, uh, the ing phrase, the passive phrase, and the main verb phrase um, pattern together. And the, for example, the perfect phrase or the complement of a modal are different. They are much bigger, it seems to be. So with respect to a crude macro division of the clause into VP domain and TP domain, seems like progressive is low. And this actually, what we know about selection also supports this, uh, this idea. We've already seen that auxionsart is one of the verbal properties that's low. Um, it's encoded by lexical items. Um, and as we know, the progressive in English actually selects for axioms art. So it selects, it doesn't combine with states, it can only combine with dynamic things. All right, so that's English, that's ing, it's low. And we know that uh, English and Slavic languages are different. And it's a natural thought then to take the difference in meaning between the English progressive and the Russian imperfective um, to bolster the idea that the latter, so the Russian imperfective is actually a true aspectual head. It's higher, it's in the spatial temporal domain, whereas the English construction is rooted in the lower, more axionsartal domain. However, now I would argue that uh, appearances are deceiving there and uh, such a conclusion, you know, it's very seductive if we have these beliefs about the FSEC, but it, I think, would be incorrect. So now I refer you to a very detailed work that's been done by Sergei Tatevosov um, uh, on the aspectual architecture of Russian. And he argues extensively that despite initial um, uh, appearances, the, um, the, the, for example, the secondary uh, imperfective suffix in Russian is actually low down in the clause. It's not high up in the aspectual domain. Um, it feeds information on the aspectual node, which he believes exists and is in a higher domain, but the actual morpheme is low. Um, so if you look at the, um, if you look at A, a and A, B there, you see uh, the two hypotheses. One is that the EVA is an imperfective head in the high domain. Oh, sorry. The HB uh, has the imperfective head in the higher domain and the the EVA is low underneath little v, um, uh, whereas 8A uh, uh, has the EVA high uh, outside little v. Did I say that backwards? Yeah, you can see the you can see the label bracketing. In one case, the EVA is low underneath little v. In the other case, it's above little v in an aspectual head. These are his two hypotheses, and he argues that 8B is correct, not 8A. And again, I, uh, I refer you to his paper, but I give you one little um, indication of the, the kinds of argumentation he uses. I think this is a, this is a nice argument. Um, he, uh, uh, this has got to do with the um, Russian prefix pere. Um, and here we have a, a verb which has the prefix and, and the secondary imperfective suffix eva there. And what's interesting about the prefix pere is that it has a subject object asymmetry built into it. So it is a distributive uh, prefix and it distributes over the internal argument, not the external one, as you can see from the data in nine. So pere must take scope below the projection where the external argument is merged. But now here's the here's the, the, the point about Eva is that 
pere it's, itself scopes over eva since the whole form behaves like a perfective not an imperfective so pere must be under the external argument but it must be over the eva because it makes the whole thing perfective okay and he has a lot of other arguments um and he ends up endorsing a proposal whereby the ultimate special interpretation is formally dependent on the semantics and the event structure of the eventuality built up by the root, but together with its prefixes and even this um, secondary and perfective marker. Um, so what I would argue here, what this is showing us um, is that Number one, both Russian and English have morphological devices that create derived eventualities within this lowest domain of the clause. Um, but in the case of English, the progressive creates a derived state, as I've argued. And in the case of Russian, uh, it creates a derived uh, homogeneous eventuality. So the semantics is different. Um, in fact, Bonnemeyer and Swift have argued that languages systematically vary with respect to whether they care about states or uh, atelicity in setting up their tense system. So both Russian, uh, the imperfective marking, and the English progressive are actually extremely similar. They are low and they... Uh, they have they give rise to all of these intentional paradoxes because they don't entail the actualization of the base stem they are attached to. So in both cases, we find that we need formal accounts that make heavy use of possible worlds machinery. Okay. Um, and my view is that the intentionality of the combinatorics here is a clue that these functors occupy, in fact, yes, the lowest zone. And this is the zone uh, of the, what I'm going to argue is the symbol, essential and non-particularized content. So for concreteness, I give you my uh, analysis of the English progressive ing, which says you take ing and you merge it with another symbol and you get a derived state. And then there's the uh, Russian eva, which is the same domain. You take eva and you attach it to a, a lexical verb and you get not a derived state, but a derived homogeneous eventuality. So the semantics is different, but actually they are sitting in the same zone and they've got a lot of um, uh, commonalities in terms of what they are doing. So a proponent of a fine-grained universal FSEC would be forced to say the, the head in English, which creates a, a derived state, and the head F2 in Russian that creates a homogeneous event, those exist in all languages and you have to put them in there and they have to be ordered somehow. But how do you order F1 and F2 when F1 exists in English and F2 exists in Russian? And for all intents and purposes, they both seem to be in roughly the same place. We have no evidence for ordering um, between them. So I would say this seems quite unfalsifiable to put them in any order. On the other hand, they're both the same in some sense. They're both axions art manipulating functional heads. They select for and modify abstract event properties and create new uh, conceptual intentional content. So uh, my uh, what I conclude from these two kinds of case studies is that uh, number one, the same meaning often appears with different flavors in different zones. And then within a zone, there are semantically different language specific functions, functors that could exist while still conforming to the overall flavor of that zone. So the bad news then, uh, which I've been trying to warn you about since the beginning of the talk, is there seems there may be no non-circular way to define functional heads semantically to form a well-ordered FSEC. At least if we operate with primitives such as cause and telos and possibility. And those are the primitives that we get from our extensional semantics toolbox. And, uh, and those particular primitives duplicate across zones, I argue. And yet meaning layering does exist. I'm not going to deny that. And the flavors remain, suggesting, um, perhaps even more radically now, that truth conditions themselves are not quite capturing what's at stake here between the zones. Yeah. So that was fast. 
and I'm not done yet. I'm sort of two thirds of the way through. So this is the taking stock slide where we kind of go, okay, that's bad news. That's like really depressing actually. So what do we do about this? And is that all, was that cartographic stuff really useless? And that's not my point at all. No, it was really, really important. It's really, really important to do the the hard work on each language to figure out um, how the phrase structures are ordered because languages tend to do that. Um, but now we have to take all the evidence and be willing to take that to its logical conclusion. And what I want to propose is a slightly different way, a kind of a, re, a retooling of the idea of zones to, to make sense of my diagnosis here, what I, what I think is going on. So here's where we also get to the title of my talk, which is the symbolic domain. And I want to try to convince you that uh, this lowest domain is weirder and more exciting and more important than um, the normal sort of view of extended projections would have you think. Because going back to Grimshaw, right, the lexical item was at the bottom and then all the excitement was in the functional items that were on the top. And that has been taken to its logical conclusion in uh, architectures such as DM, which um, for whom like the lexical item or the root is the most dull and boring lumpish thing, which sits at the bottom of the tree and is really not involved in any kind of interesting uh, compositional action. Uh, but what I want to try to convince you of is that the, the symbol is an absolutely crucial part of the system, that it, there's way more compositional complexity um, going on there. And it's uh, the challenge is to figure out how the human <clears throat> natural language system, how the human mind, how the human cognition manages to do this trick of compositional meaning using this, this inventory of reusable symbols to do so. And I think this is part of the thing we need to understand. It doesn't help just to relegate the lexicon or the symbol to some no man's land. Um, okay. So here's what I think. I think that at the level of the symbol, we build up this sort of essential symbolic content. By essential, I mean, it's like not, um, it's not dependent on contingent facts about the world. Um, and these, uh, these symbolic contents are not easily describable um, using an extensional or, or truth-making toolbox. Um, in this, I sort of agree with Paul Petrosky, who believes that lexical items are send sort of cognitive their uh, instructions, and that uh, these items eventually feed structures that are truth valuable and have uh, truth conditions, but they themselves cannot really be characterized very well in terms of truth conditions. So, what is it about the symbol that has to be this way, in a way? It's, uh, we know from psychoneurolinguistics that it's stored in long-term declarative memory. It's reusable, which means that you have to be able to deploy a particular symbol in many, many, many different unlimited actual situations of use. Um, and it's, uh, and because of that, I think it's polysimous and flexible. And it's also perspectively rel relative. And these are, uh, design features and not bugs of the system. Um, so the proposal therefore is that zone one, the lowest zone, the one that uh, Ramchan and Spinoni has called events is actually the domain of symbol and symbol combinatorics, symbol combination. Whereas zone two, uh, the situational zone, we called it then, um, is actually the inflectional zone, which is the domain of reference that's when you get truth valuable content, reference, instantiation in space and time. It's only when you get that instantiated in space and time that truth conditions even become relevant. Okay. Um, 
I want to throw in a little quote um, as a nod to uh, Stan Dehen here because he's been thinking quite hard about what makes human cognition special. And he's a little bit of a, uh, he doesn't think language is special. We might agree or disagree with him uh, on that. But what he does think is special is um, the human ability to, uh, there's two things. It's not just the, the recursive ability, which he uh, he thinks is special, but also symbolic discretization is um, is something that the human mind does, and it's actually really necessary because it allows uh, information compression. So uh, all of these domains where we do really really uh, powerful cognitive computation as humans. Uh, we we manage a discret, discretization of the domain by using a small set of symbols. Well, it's not small in the case of language, but it's a finite set of symbols. Um, and then use their recursive combination uh, in, in mental programs, which involve nested repetitions and variations. So I think we as syntacticians and semanticists have been very, you know, we noticed right from the beginning that this recursive composition thing was uh, a cool and unusual fact about language. But I think we've actually underestimated um, uh, the lexicon and its role in uh, getting this whole thing off the ground. So uh, the symbol is, however, one of the reasons why we haven't come to it as a, as a thing, I think is because uh, formal semantics with its, extent, with its sort of truth uh, conditional toolbox, um, the primitives are all couched in extensional terms. So it kind of flattens out the way in which the symbol and the functional content get put together to create truth valuable content. So, uh, and whenever it tries to write down a denotation for a root, it has to over persistify it. It can't capture that massive polysemy, which is the reality of the symbol, in fact. So symbols, lexical items are conceptually polysemous, even though they are sort of atomic with respect to the recursive system. And they even undergo productive compositional processes among themselves, um, which is a which is a big problem for truth conditional theories of uh, um, uh, semantic composition. Um, we have now very strong neurological evidence that lexical access corresponds to these polysemic symbolic meanings that we don't have different meanings for the different uh, versions, but that we have one point of lexical access for all of them, and in fact all the in inflectional variants. Uh, typological processing and acquisitional data show the cognitive easiness and ubiquity of polysemy at the symbolic level. Please ask me about all of those um, bits of literature if you're interested. Um, so if the linguist's job is to understand isemantics, by which I mean, you know, uh, how the human mind puts meanings together, um, and not e-semantics, e-semantics is to just describe the truth conditions, um, then we need a different model of meaning, or rather we need to unpack a little before we get to the domain where, where, where truth-making is actually um, uh, relevant. Now, we need truth-making, we need to connect to the world somehow, but what I'm arguing is that we've kind of uh, flattened out or ignored um, the stage before that, where the human mind deploys the symbol and then clothes it in particularizing information. So, um, and the symbol itself, this, this, uh, this thing we memorize, um, extremely powerful. It's an active tool for grasping meanings. We choose to use that tool to interpret the world. We need to understand its general role in the system rather than simply describing, you know, it's, extensional long-term effects after it's been deployed. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, so what I'm arguing here is that inflected forms, um, so a, a word plus inflection, um, inflected forms of the same 
stem or root are linked by virtue of the fact that they share the same symbolic content and inflectional morphology is what you acquire in zone two. Whereas derivations um, are uh, cases where morphemes have some sort of symbolic content themselves and they are combined in zone one. So I'm thinking of things like breakable, broken, breaking, things where you can put things together without any actuality entailments, where you get all kinds of intentionality paradoxes, et cetera. Um, the symbol is necessary for both compression and combination. And um, you need information compression for in a symbolic system because you want to be able to, in principle, cover a full expressive ground. Um, and that is why uh, linguistic abstract symbols actually have to be uh, polysemous. Um, so symbolic discretization and polysemy com uh, combined with this recursive system is what gives language its generative power. So if you look, now I'll give you the, the, the diagram from uh, Ramchand and Svenonis again, but, but sort of rejigged. Uh, to give you what I think is actually going on. That lowest zone events, I already, already sort of said it was a temporal, but it's really special. That symbolic domain uh, is pre-extensional. It's got to do with some kind of um, conceptual combination. The next zone uh, involves uh, particularizing information or instantiational content. And only when you get into that second zone, you have anything that's sort of uh, suitable for um, uh, a truth-making kind of um, algorithm. And then the top level is when you um, relate the speaker to the, the situation asserted. So to get from the symbolic domain to the inflectional domain, how do you do it? This is really hard. The reason why nobody has said that this is the way that SINSEM works on an FSEC is because our, our, our Church, Tarski, Toolbox, our formal semantics, just simply won't deal with denotations like that in the symbolic zone. It just, we you can't write them. You cannot use that toolbox. So we have to figure out a different way of understanding how those meanings are used to create truth valuable utterances. And then we have to do something quite radical. I think we have to get into cognitive science um, we have to do experiments, um, but there's one other ingredient that I want to introduce here, which I think is relevant to the cartographic enterprise, um, which is that to get from the symbolic domain to the inflectional domain, to get from the abstract reusable symbol uh, to truth of valuable content, you need to fold in information about the speaker and the utterance event. So, uh, to do this, um, you need the mediation of the utterance event or a demonstration. And now I want to uh, give you an analogy. Or do you think I'm going really, really far here, uh, going out on a limb? But what I'm really trying to do is um, relate what we as linguists know um, about the structure of sentences to cognitive science more generally um, and the progress that's being made across the pond as it were. So uh, when Marr famously, where we all, we love Marr, right? We've, we, we know his work, but uh, one thing that uh, doesn't get mentioned so much is that when he set up his visual system with its kind of different domains, um, to get from the symbolic inner domain, the primal sketch, to the, uh, the, the, the full on 3D representation of the objective world, in between that, what he's called the two and a half dimension level, that's where you have to um, fold in the speaker perspective. And here we're talking just purely space. Okay. So uh, I'm saying exactly the same thing for the linguistic domain that there are these sort of this abstract level um, using sort of mental mentally represented symbols, which are used to represent the world. But then you need to incorporate the knowledge of who the perspective taker is in order to translate that into something which actually has truth conditions. And 
those of you who are philosophers will recognize this um, also as um, Kaplan's point um, uh, in his work on demonstratives, where he says that the character needs to be paired with context before uh, you can produce actual content. Oh my God, I, my, my birds are flying around in the cage behind me and going crazy, even though I've covered them with a, with a, with a blanket. I, I guess they notice that I'm talking very animatedly and they want to join in. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I, if I seem a little bit distracted. Okay. Birds, shush. <clears throat> now, um, so the reification of the utterance event uh, in my story performs the same cognitive function as the folding in of subjective perspective in the purely visual domain. So this is what I would uh, represent now. Um, this is the same uh, picture as I had before, but now uh, what I would like to argue is that uh, the symbolic domain, which is the lowest one there, um, is then mm, um, deployed during the course of an utterance event, I incorporate a demonstration variable. And once you've done that, you get um, a formula which is truth valuable. And then you have business as usual. Okay, why should I care? Consequences for the cartographic enterprise. For the cartographic enterprise, this has an immediate rather unusual prediction that context by means of the utterance event gets folded in rather early on this view in the compositional buildup of the proposition at the left, left edge of zone one. And the highest propositional zone is, is relevant only because everything else gets bound off. So the last thing you're left with is the, is the utterance context. And that's, the, that's what characterizes the top zone. So I wanna come back to the foundational question because we've, we've gone very far afield. Um, first, I presented a rather negative, a, a set of negative arguments for what the functional sequence should not be and, and, and a way, the way we should not be thinking about it. Um, and then I went, I, I tried to give you, because I don't want to just say negative things, I tried to tell you what I actually think um, is the source of the deep meaning layering that we find. Um, and you might ask, well, is that syntax, is it semantics, is it cognition? Well, actually meaning layering uh, to the extent that it is robust and universal rep reflects the logical priority of the symbolic reusable contents versus referential and contingent information. And this is essentially a third factor consideration as opposed to anything that's innate syntactic or even domain general cognitive template. It is very specific to setting up a recursive symbolic system. Okay. Fine-grained universal detail is not supported by semantic evidence. I think that due to seductive confirmation bias, we might miss generalizations if we presuppose an overly fine-grained FSEC that's universal. Um, on the other hand, essential content versus referential and particularizing information is a new way of characterizing formatives that I believe may be fruitful in uncovering further patterns in form and processing. And there is no substitution for um, research on language specific syntactic description. I think cartography is basically figuring out the phrase structure and we have to keep doing it. Um, uh, the discussions are still raging. There's still a lot we don't understand. So um, we still need to be doing this to understand the scope of the things that can appear in each of the layers. Um, and I believe in principle, um, these things are quite open within the limits uh, imposed by the broad zones that I have argued for. Okay, I will stop now because I'm I've talked for 50 minutes now, I think. So those are the references and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, <clears throat> we definitely have some time for questions and comments. People can use the little electronic hand. Um, Jillian, you want to take those or? 
Well, Mr. let's see. Shall I stop well, I sharing? Can because do it. right now I'm only seeing yeah. like the top. <clears throat> we might as well stop sharing. And yeah. if we need to go back to the slides, of yeah. course we can. And people, okay. please turn your cameras on so that the speaker can see her audience a bit. We appreciate that when you do that, if you can. And now you want to, you can take them, Jillian. Yeah. Okay. So someone from Moscow, da Dania Kasenov. Yeah, um, th thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'll stick to two short ones. The first one is, uh, I didn't quite get uh, how does layering follow from a uh, logical necessity of having reusable and non-reusable uh, uh, meanings. And the second question is, if you, it's a bit more particular, if you introduce the utterance event as low as the edge of the zone one, uh, where does the uh, layering of zones two and three, I think you would call them that, where does that come from? Uh, right, um, yeah, both, uh, both uh, great questions that I scooted over way too fast. Um, let me first, uh, maybe take the second one first. So, um, what I assume is that the the variable for the utterance is introduced at the top of zone one, um, and uh, in doing so, it creates um, a, a variable over spatial uh, spatial temporal properties of events, and that at the edge of zone two, uh, oh yeah, and at the end of zone one, you you existentially quantify the symbolic zone. And then at the edge of zone two, what you do is you existentially quantify the uh, the spatial properties variable and are left only with uh, um, uh, a, a predicate over the utterance event. So when you get to zone three, it's just a predicate over D, right? So, so if you want to just modi modify D, that's where you have to do it because then that's the only, that's the kind of last uh, variable left. So that was the easier question. <laughs> and then your first question was, um, how does this actually account for the layering? Like, why would you, so my, um, my suggestion is that in, in constructing um, an utterance, you have to start with the elements in declarative memory, and then you deploy them in a context. So there's a logical priority to the way you build up a proposition. You first have to, you, you use the, the, the long-term semantic memory tools, and then you um, uh, relate them to the context. So you start from the inside and, and relate it to the outside. It's, I don't know, maybe it's, it's too, maybe it's a little bit um, vague um, because we don't yet have a really algorithmic understanding of how um, utterances are produced in real time in real brains. But, but that's precisely the research that's being done now. And we need sort of hypotheses uh, about that happen, how, how that happens. Um, uh, that that can be specifically tested. So my my proposal is that um, not that I say, hey, I got the answer. My proposal is that it is a third factor thing, and that, that we will find that once we look at the way in which minds have to build propositions, um, it that 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 there is a sort of um, uh, um, algorithmic algorithmic necessity to doing it in that order. So yeah, there's a there's a lot that still needs to be worked out there, but the proposal is that we shouldn't look for it in um in a sort of syntactic template which is sort of hardwired in our genes or something. And we also probably can't look for it in domain general cognition because I think making a symbolic communicative system is quite a special task. Yeah. So but you know, I'm quite quite open uh, about that. It's just like that is my um, that's my hunch, and that's where I think the explanation is going to end up lying. Did I answer the question?
Okay. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Jillian, I don't know if you see that okay. from Distria. Okay. <laughs> oh, da -da -da -da. Let me go down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I'm not able to speak. I'm in a noisy place. Yeah, my birds. Um, but my question is, you mentioned the help and involvement of cognitive science. Is this for the transition of zone one to zone two or for isomatics, e-semantics, or for a combination of both? I think specifically it's, um, I think that cognitive science is really, or rather psycholinguistics, they've been worrying about things like lexical access and priming and things like that which is really all about what goes on uh, when you grab a lexical item. So it's very relevant for zone one and how you get from zone one to zone two. But they're just kind of doing their work in a vacuum because they're not really talking to us uh, because our theories are not set up to talk to them in, in a way. Um, it's, it's hard to say, uh, that's why it's hard to say, um, are they helping us with zone one or are they helping us? I think they have always been trying to do eye semantics. So I think that is the thing. They 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 they're trying to figure out what's going on in the mind, whereas formal semanticists are writing down what the verifiable truth conditions are. And both of those things are necessary, but we need somehow to figure out how the mental um uh how we mentally do that trick of of using symbols to um express what's in our minds and uh describe things in the world so i think the cognitive sciences have been doing i semantics they just don't call it that they just call that cognitive science um the part of linguistics that of language that is i semantics uh, that's that's why i call it i semantics um They've been doing that all the time, but they're not very interested in truth conditions and they're just not interested in syntactic structures. So we have a lot to, to tell each other, I think. I don't know if I answered that question. Okay, yeah, she said, thank you. Okay. I know maybe I went too fast when I when there aren't loads and loads of questions. I always worry that I went too fast. But you guys do have the slides. Oh, uh, yeah. Do I see another hand? Let me just. Uh, two, two. Here we have Patricia and and. Oh Dania, yeah, there, there's Patricia. Yeah, I see her. So, yeah, go ahead, Patricia. Hi. So, so I might not have grasped everything properly, but one question that occurred to me is, do you see, so you talk about this as a third factor effect. And so do you see this also, for example, as involved in, in the experience of human consciousness and how, so, you know, we have like a lexicon, if you will, of our conscious experiences. Um, so, I mean, I'm thinking, I don't know if you're familiar with, with uh, ideas of consciousness where, where um you know we are it it's it's basically idealistic in the sense that there are, are um we are not directly experiencing reality uh, but it's not through you know physical hardwired brain it's how we under so you can think of everything you experience as like the the icons on your desktop if you will they're very useful symbols that we use to understand reality or we use to survive well in reality that's one thing. So I'm okay, wondering. I see. Okay, I see what you're you're getting at. So this is kind of the the difference of like internalist views of meaning and externalist views of meaning, and um, it's it's an interesting situation because after all, when we acquire the meanings of lexical items, which we somehow have to represent in our long term declarative semantic memory, we do acquire it on the basis of episodic uh, um, experience, yeah? But we somehow do um, generalize and distill and and there's a lot we don't understand about memory, but but this is this is somehow what happens is that we end up with these abstract mentally represented versions of of the meaning, which are then liberated from their their um uh first uh 
uh, of course, they're massively influenced by the by by the first content or their first experiences of use, but they can be used in many, many different ways and, and extended and deployed in ways that you may never have heard before. So we get from this sort of experience, we represent some rather abstract mental concepts, which we can then deploy and use to make sense of the world. And the, the connection to the world comes in both directions. One is like, what do we choose to generalize, right? Uh, both in in when we have the input experience and then later when we have the the interpretational I think of a symbol as a kind of a as a as a grasping hand or a hammer it's like okay I'm going to use this hammer to grasp this and try to convey it to somebody else because the world is infinitely large and there's an infinite amount of detail yet we have the symbols that we have in order to um, uh, describe it and we make those active conscious choices all the time. So if you're asking me, is there such a thing as internalist abstract meaning that's mentally represented? I would say absolutely. I think that has to be true. That's one of the tricks the human mind does. But is it completely divorced from reality? No. I mean, we get the ones we get because of the way our sensory systems work about, you know, sort of deep things about the way we generalize, what we decide to generalize over, which is probably a, a lot also evolutionarily conditioned. Really fascinating question, but it's both internal and determined by our interaction with the external world in both directions. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, I have somebody <laughs> here. Uh, I have someone here, Seva, and then I have, us. Uh, is it Sasha? Sorry, my eyes aren't very good. First, uh, Seva. Okay, uh, thanks. I have sort of a composite question. So as far as I understand, you mostly refer to the verbal domain, but these zones, these three zones are supposed to be present in the FSEC of like each extended projection, like the nominal and so, so on, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, then if we are building, say, just the first phase of the verbal domain with, with all its arguments, and it's supposed to be zone one for, for the verb, but we are already merging it with the nominals, which have all this extended projection and are kind of supposed to be uh, all the way to zone three. So can we combine these elements of like different different zones with each other? Is it supposed to work that way? Yeah, great question. Um, and it is the exactly the right question. And uh, what's one of the reasons I don't talk about nominal phrases in this kind of talk is because it 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 opens up um, another aspect of the system, which is um, non-standard, I would say. Okay, so you're quite right. I believe that in the nominal uh, extended projection as well, you have a, a zone one, which is the conceptual content. And then you get the particularizing information, which comes in the form of determiners. And I think I think maybe even case is, is up there on that. So you're absolutely right. And then quantifiers are even higher. So uh, what I actually think is that we have been we have been fooled by the fact that we have two dimensional bits of paper and pencils that have been drawing our trees too flat. Um, and we've been mistaking, we've been mistaking the way we draw them for linearization. What I actually think is that the the mental representation of these forms involves uh, are you familiar with like Sportish's idea? of uh, um, it's a kind of a laddering structure where you have the verb verbal extended projection let's say my little pinky is zone one and you have the nominal extended projection they actually connect like this and then the linearization algorithms have to choose uh, where uh, so first of all you 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 linearize this together and then you have to decide where in the the verbal uh, connectome it gets linearized but in terms of the thing that's built up algorithmically and the way that the meaning is built up uh, actually the uh, 
zone one combines with zone one and then ladders up to combine with zone two uh, and then zone three. So I didn't want to tell you all of that because you'd have thought, no, she's really crazy. But if you think about it, go home and think about it for a second. There is absolutely no reason why a three dimensional brain would be forming mental representations that are right downable on flat paper. There's, there's no reason why uh, the kind of uh, multi-planar uh, representation that I'm suggesting and that actually Sportish suggested um, is not the simplest and most natural. You then just need a real theory of how in each language uh, these uh, complex molecules are linearized. I bet that was that just was that just too much information, Seva? No, thanks. It's kind of exciting, actually. Okay. okay, so now I have Sasha, who's been waiting. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I have understood you correctly. Well, uh, when you were talking about, well, um, internal meanings being the property of the human mind and external meanings being kind of a secondary thing to that, I wonder whether this means that, well, um, a somehow somehow like externalist explanation for semantic uh, phenomena are kind of extra linguistic. Like this is not the property of uh, the human mind, hence probably the human language, that those are just some kind of uh, non-linguistic observations. Um, no, I don't wanna dump truth conditions completely. I think we need truth making and truth conditions to sort of anchor, to sort of kind of get out of the language loop. We, if we want to talk about meanings, at, at some point, you know, we do need to anchor it in at least human judgments of what the aboutness of language is. Um, I do think we need to change perspective a little bit. You know, it's not, it's not just like we are communicating things about the world to other people. After all, the other person also has access to the world. I think that in some sense, what language is doing is providing a mind-to-mind -mind inter interface and using the external world as a pivot, right? Because that's the thing we share and language is the mind-to-mind -mind interface. That's, that's what's important. We're sharing the contents of each other's minds and thoughts. That's what you need for planning and, and social organization or whatever. We, you know, we see the world, we're sharing each other's minds, but the world is important because it's that pivot of shared experience. So um, I don't want to say, no, extensional stuff is not even linguistic. Language is really cool because it's trying to make that connection between, you know, us inside our heads and, and the world we live in and other, other people who are living in that same world with us who we are communicating with. Okay, yeah. Also, also, I like the like what you said about uh, like language being the interface, like mind to mind interface. I think that's very aphoristic. Yeah, and I don't want to take credit for that. I got that from Mark Dingmanse, who who said it in some salon um, article. So uh, I I, I want to give him credit for that. I read it from him, and I thought, yes, that is exactly right. Yeah, I agree with, I agree too. That's I, when I read it, I thought, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Does Daniar ha also have an, still another question or is his hand well, still up? I, from I, I, ju I just, maybe if we have time, wanted to hear a bit more about the uh, psycho neuro linguistic data that you think supports your idea, and I had a more particular question about the difference between like inflectional, like n n not the old uh, cut, cut, cross cut between inflectional and derivational, but maybe something more, <clears throat> more uh, general, like the difference in uh, representation of uh, tense and I don't know, causatives, something like that. Uh, um, okay, so. The information, so the neuro and psycho stuff on inflection versus derivation as the most robust information there is mostly um, in the nominal domain, I'm afraid. But what it shows is that, uh, nope, okay. No, there is some verbal stuff. So, uh, so 
uh, it's got to do with lexical priming, which is an extremely simple kind of uh, psycholinguistic test where you measure reaction times in deciding whether something's a word or not. And then you feed people with, um, uh, with inf prior information and see whether it speeds, it speeds up their reactions or not. And if it has, if it does speed up their reactions, then it, um, right, then it somehow is pre-activating or help, helping to activate the thing that you're trying to, uh, to, to activate the second time. Uh, and so the baseline is that a word will prime its identity. So table will prime table. If you've just seen table, you're really fast in recognizing table as a word the next time you see it. And then uh, all the inflectional forms of table prime table just as easily as table does. That's the, uh, and the same with, for example, the past tense. And you have to be very careful though, because you have to control for phonological priming as well. Um, so if you take an inflectional form like past tense of went and go, they prime each other just as easily as go and goes or go and go. Right. So it shows that uh, it's not just phonological similarity, but uh, somehow all of the inflectional forms prime each other really, really fast and really robustly. Um, but inflectional endings themselves do not prime each other, whereas derivational endings do prime each other. And while there is some priming between derived forms and other thing, other roots, it's not as strong as that for either inflectional priming or identity priming. So that's the kind of evidence that uh, I was using to, um, to motivate the distinction between inflectional and derivational forms. And also the fact that um, uh, there seem to be some aspects of broker's area that are more sensitive to inflection uh, that are not sensitive to derivation. Um, so that's what I was thinking of. And wait, was there another part of the question that I'm missing? Where is he? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I don't think there's. Maybe I forgot as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay. I think I have this. A hand is Alexander. Uh, yeah. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I just have a clarification question. Maybe I got something wrong. So, uh, is it right that all of this in is in the narrow syntax part of uh, all that stuff? So. Is there a way to like uh, transfer those these zones into the LF interface? That way, we would not lose the modularity and kind of get this good autonomous syntax. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm arguing against that old view. I think, you know, that was the last century. I think it was a great way to start off to think about modules. I think that I think that that's been overstated. I think the autonomy of syntax has been overstated. I think that uh, the lexicon um, interacts like sort of long-term memory and working memory are constantly in cyclic communication. I just think that, I, I just think that some of those old um, pieces of dogma, it's time to rethink them. So no, I don't want to redo this architecture to kind of cordon everything off. I think I'm getting uh, um, a better dialogue with what's going on in um, uh, the other fields of neuroscience and psycholinguistics by letting go of those dogmas, actually. So no, I don't want to do that. I mean, you can try to do that, and that would be great because then we could have a dialogue about whether it makes any sense to try to rethink of it in those terms, but I'm not going there, no. Okay. Um, I think there is one more question in chat from Steopa. Okay, in the chat. Uh, okay, I wonder whether more cognitively oriented work in lexical semantics would qualify as I semantics. So I was thinking work in lexical topology, typology and frame semantics, but also work in cognitive grammar, metaphor theory. Um, yeah, so I agree. Um, I think that there are some people in that um, family of, um, of research, um, uh, who are doing what I would call I semantics. Um, 
sometimes I'm not completely convinced by some of their methodologies, but there are a lot of people who are doing really, really um, important descriptive work there. So yes, I would say that is iSemantics. Yeah. Yeah. Jillian, I, um, we're almost out of time, but I'm without raising the little hand I want to also ask, <laughs> ask something if I can. Um, yeah. You started off by saying, um, when we look at sort of traditional cartography, you ask the syntacticians and they say, ask the semanticists, right? Mm -hmm. And then the semanticists can't help us either, but now you've sort of showed us a way in which the semanticists or some better understanding of that side of things can help us. So my question is maybe a very naive question. So now we go back to the syntacticians. I mean, there still are syntacticians, right? I mean, this isn't the death of syntax. I mean, no. I hope not entirely, right? So, um, so when we so the sort of basic syntactic operations of building phrase structure that called upon cartographic templates to do the job correctly, um, is that does that do you, in your world does that function? The, how like what what is a syntactician who a hundred percent lives in your world? Um, how do they build phrase structure and and what do they call upon cartographic templates anyway? Just you are giving them a reason to how to understand where they came from, or do we need to be building phrase structure in a different way? I hope that makes sense. Well, yeah, no, I think this is a great question to end with, and I try to end with it in my talk too because I. I said, well, you know, we, we still have a lot of work to do on the syntactic side to be describing phrase structures. Um, I think, you know, we have, we as actual linguists who care about the way languages are put together uh, are the only source of information for the neurologists and the cognitive scientists who are just like uh, mucking around with, with brains. They don't understand the details of language. That is our best source of evidence for for the kinds of things that are that are going on in the way human beings put together meanings. So I don't I absolutely don't think this is a death of syntax just because I'm saying that. So what I'm saying is that don't grab a template off the shelf and assume that it's universal and then shove everything into it. Okay? I do think you can use the general organizing organizational principle, which is that there's sort of conceptual symbolic content, and then there's particularizing content, and then there's more speaker-oriented content. And that is a good guide. And probably what you find is going to fall into those zones. But you should, uh, and then when you uh, figure out the phrase structure of a particular language, you just to do the, you know, we're, we're syntacticians, we're good at that. You do the detailed descriptive work to figure out what's the morpheme, what's it doing, what's it actually doing. Don't just lazily grab for a cartographic label. Oh, this must be ASP, right? Um, actually do the, we've got, we've got really good tools and methodologies from the last, you know, 40 years of generative grammar that, that will allow us to do better than that. So, we need to 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 produce rich descriptions, but without assuming that there's a universal template which goes, you know, um, you know, telic phrase followed by prog p, followed by perf p, followed by right. Let's not do that. Let's actually um, um, do it a little bit bottom up. Um, but with the with the still with the with the top down understanding that's coming from the generalizations that we're also trying to make, and I think the the zonal stuff is part of that. Um, but I still I think there's a lot there's that there's still to understand um, by looking at actual languages and not just simply um, you know self fulfilling predictions about you know slotting things into a cartographic template. That's what I would say. I don't know if that makes sense Thank to you. It does. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, are there any other comments or questions? We're just coming up on the half hour, so perfect timing. Um, if not, let us thank our speaker, which you can do in various ways. One way is like that. Another way is like this, with actual yeah. noise. Um, thank you. Will. Thanks to you. Julian, um, and we will, if it's okay with you, we'll post the slides on the website so people can take a look in more detail. Um, and we will see you all 
next time. Yeah, and uh, yeah. thanks again for inviting me. This was fun. It was great to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs>